Jason, how are you, sir? Good, Chris. It is brilliant to be on the show with you, man. Really looking forward to it. You look so, so well, so composed, and you've got great audio. You're, you're a podcaster's dream, mate. Well, I, I try. I try. I, I recently started up a podcast myself just because I love impacting people. So I got a little bit of a equipment, not much, though. But um, yeah, it's uh, I'm freezing, though. <laughs> It's cold today, so I've got my woolly jumper on and everything. Hey, you're in the UK. What did you expect? I know, man. I know. I know. Which I always tell people, because oftentimes when people listen to me, they listen to more about to trying to figure out where I'm from because my accent's so weird. So I'm from, from Texas, but I live here in the UK up in the north. So yeah, it's cold, man. <laughs> hey, Texas. Do you remember Dallas? Is that... Yeah, uh, I didn't watch it too much, but yeah, I remember it was big when I was a kid. I'm guessing you're probably a bit younger than me, and that's a compliment. But a little bit. Well, I don't know actually. I don't know. I'm I'm 42 right now, so don't yes. know how old you are. So yeah, you're nine years my junior. So okay. da- Dallas wouldn't have been the bigger hit for you as it was over here when I was a was like young teenager probably. Um, Jr. Big bad Jr. and everyone yeah, loved yeah. him. Larry Hagman. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. I remember Jr. Everyone talking about Jr. I was, I was. I think that that was going on in the early '80s, which I was just. I was a young kid, so I didn't. I just heard about it, but I never really watched it. So. Yeah, it was. It was legendary in its day, and Larry Hagman would come over here and go on our chat shows, and I think it was Terry Wogan. He went, Terry, I bought you some good old Texas bullshit. <laughs> and it, it literally gave him a, a glass jar jar with some bullshit. <laughs> That's <laughs> you know, funny. Being steer country or, or whatever you call it. And yeah, yeah. To us, to conservative Britain back then, especially on the BBC, it was like, oh, he just said bullshit. We're, we're, not, we're not allowed to say that on, t- on TV. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy, man. So can we dive in, Jason? Just I'm thinking of, of friends at home that probably haven't got a lot of time to watch a huge great podcast you've yeah. been in a plane you survived a plane crash yeah yeah i'm yeah. well aware that um was it three people didn't that's correct yeah me and one other guy survived and three didn't they, they passed away that day yeah can you start from the beginning what was the flight about yeah sure absolutely so um i was living in texas at the time and uh i i was in my early 20s and uh, it was uh, January 17th, 2002. It was a Thursday. And uh, we, I was involved uh, in a church and we had kind of an outreach community thing as well that we were doing. And uh, we were looking at creating a youth facility um, just for like a um, youth facility where people, you know, kids could come after school, hang out, do stuff like that. And and, uh, you know, had ba- indoor basketball courts and arcade games and just, you know, a place where, you know, youth can just come out and have fun and all that sort of stuff. And so we were we were looking at other people and other places that had kind of created um, a facility like this. So we we found a place out in Colleen Temple, Texas, um, and that had built one. So we were going out, we were flying out to just have a look at it just see what they've done and 
you know, do normal research, all that kind of stuff and just get some ideas and, you know, what, what challenges they had building all that sort of stuff. And uh, so we were, um, we had a, a friend, uh, it was actually a fr uh, the dad of one of my friends, he was a, a pilot and uh, they, they charted out a, they were doing a couple other things that day, but they charted out a twin engine uh, prop Cessna and which I'd never been on a prop plane before. Uh, so I was kind of excited. I was like, oh, this is kind of a new experience. And um, so we got on the plane in, in Houston and the flight was, was supposed to be about an hour long. And uh, we, we got up and it took off. And, and uh, for, for anyone who hasn't been in a prop plane, uh, particularly a really small one, it's loud. I'm sure you've probably been on many of them, Chris, but it, I couldn't believe how loud a little tiny prop plane was because we all started kind of chatting to at the beginning of it. And then we just were losing our voice shouting at each other. We were only like two or three feet away from each other. So, um, so anyway, I, I, was, uh, I was on the plane and I've always been very entrepreneurial. Uh, I, I started, you know, had my first business when I was 20, all that sort of stuff. And I was looking to uh, go into another business. And so I was writing down a lot of stuff, uh, just some business ideas and lots of stuff on that. So I was kind of just lost in that. And um, I, then I looked down at my watch and an, about an hour had passed. And so I thought, oh, okay, well, we must be getting pretty close, you know, to landing because it's been about an, just over an hour. And um, uh there was five of us on board um, and I knew all of them. We were all, all good friends. And the, obviously there was a pilot in the pilot seat. Um, I was in a little bucket seat. I was the only one facing the tail of the plane. I was on the right hand side um, of the plane and behind me was the co-pilot seat. And so uh, a friend of mine, he was in his early thirties. Um, he was sitting in the co-pilot seat. And so it was a bucket seat. So anytime, if I pushed back, he could feel it. If he pushed back, I could feel it. You know, it was, it was, it was like we're leaning up against each other almost. And um, he, he was always kind of known as a messer, kind of jokester type of guy. And he, he kind of turned around and looked back at us. So his face was kind of this way. And he looked back at us and, and he was like, um, hey, guys, uh, I don't think we're going to make it to the, to the airport. And um, I thought he was joking. I was like, oh, ha, ha, that's hilarious. And then he was like, he got really really serious on his face like no i'm serious i don't think we're gonna make it I, like pray so all all of us um so me um a friend of mine named cecil and then um uh, a, a a girl named angela who was as close to a blood sister that you could get with actually being a blood sister um she was 17 uh she was sitting in front of me and um so we all kind of looked at each other like oh okay this is crazy what's going on because obviously we didn't have the headphones on we couldn't hear you know what was going on between the pilot and flight control and all that and probably i don't know 30 seconds or a minute later the left hand side of the plane the engine on that the prop just stopped and so that was my right hand side because i was facing the tail and it just went quiet and i was like and i looked over and i was like whoa okay that's that's not good <laughs> And, uh, and then probably 15 seconds later, the right hand uh, side of the plane, uh, the, that prop stopped. And so it was complete silence. Like w when you're in that, that noise of those props and then it just stops, like it's a deafening silence. Like it's pretty, pretty crazy. So we were all kind of looking at each other like, wow, okay, you know, obviously this is not supposed to happen. <laughs> And, um, you know, no one was freaking out. It wasn't anything like that. It was actually quite calm. And because we all knew the pilot. I mean, I'd known him for probably 10 years. Uh, you know, he, he was a great guy. He's flown lots of stuff. So I think we all f fairly felt comfortable, you know, with him flying the plane and stuff. So we, um, we were probably flying for another, I don't know, minute or so. And then the plane banked really hard to the right. And so... Uh, what later I found all this out, but what, what he was basically doing was chatting with flight control to find out, should he have gone left where it's more kind of an open field or would he bank right to try to make it to the airport? So the decision was made to go to the airport. So we banked right. And when we did, um, when we kind of banked, I was able to look down and 
probably we were probably about 200 feet above houses it was just like rooftop 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 like it wasn't uh, we were close to the ground you know i was like wow okay we're we're really close and um and i was looking forward um or not well, my four I was looking towards um angela just trying to keep eye contact with her and just trying to you know i think just no one knew what was going on you know we just all just kind of look around like wow what what's happening and then i heard something hit on the bottom of of the plane and i don't know exactly why i did this but i, I kind of put my arm on the the rest on my left hand side and i leaned over and looked down as if i was trying to see what hit the plane which i don't know why i did that because you can't see through the plane obviously and then the next thing i know it was just this bright white light filled the plane and i was I was out. So what what had happened is we were flying over uh, the estate, the housing estate, and we had hit the top of either a tree or a telephone pole or something, which made the the noise on the bottom of the plane. And pilots, um, you probably know this, Chris, but pilots are taught when they crash crash landing to fly in between two trees to take off the wings of the plane because that's where all the fuel is stored. So that's what he was doing. He was he was trying to to fly in between two trees, which he did, but the plane was actually built a year before those regulations came in. So they, the wings didn't really break away the, the way they were supposed to. And the right wing hit a tree and it ripped the right side of the plane off and then torqued the whole plane 90 degrees into a house and just slammed right into the house into a, like a, a T junction where you know, it was the outside wall and then an inside wall. So when it hit, there was no give to the plane and it just slammed into that. So I, I woke up all, when I talk about it and when I, when I remember look back, it feels like it probably was 15 minutes, but all I'm getting ready to say now happened probably within the space of two minutes. Um, but it, it was just really weird. So I, I woke up and I was laying backwards. Um, my left arm was across my body and um, my feet were kind of trapped in rubble. And I woke up and it was kind of like, the best way I can describe it is if you've ever seen a movie where someone gets knocked out and all their visions kind of blurry, except it's the, like a really clear like pinhole type of thing. That's, that's what it was like. I, everything was blurry except this little pinhole. And I didn't, I couldn't remember where I was. I didn't know why I was on the plane. And then I remembered being on a plane. Then I thought I was on a commercial plane. And then I thought I remembered being on with friends. And then I couldn't remember. Like it was really weird. I, I, I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And then um, uh, Cecil, um, I know in the UK we call it, we, we say Cecil, but his name in the States we call him Cecil. Um, he, uh, I heard him saying, um, get off me, get off me. So I, I, he must have, fallen like been thrown forward and i landed on top of him so i remember him saying that and then as soon as i remember him saying that i forgot he was there again like it was it was just really weird so i i was laying there and i thought well let me let me sit up so i went to sit up but my arm would move and i, and I couldn't get up for a second and i looked down and my arm looked just kind of funny i thought it was broken it it wasn't but it i thought it was um but i couldn't move it and what, what had happened is when I had leaned over like this to look down at the bottom of the plane with my arm up, when the right hand side got ripped off, part of it um, sliced down the left hand side and it sliced um, back by, on my left tricep um, all the way down to the bone. And uh, probably about five or six months later, we actually went to go look at the plane and all that. And my seat belt that I was wearing, it looked like someone had taken scissors. It was like a clean cut right through my seat belt. And I'd, I'd asked, I was like, did, was, did someone cut this? Obviously I wasn't cut out of the plane because I ended up walking out, which I'll tell you about in a second. So basically what some of the people that were doing a lot of investigation afterwards, they said if I would have been sitting up properly, it probably would have sliced through the left-hand side of my body because it just sliced through like my seatbelt and my arm and everything. So um, it's probably one of the things that saved my life on that day for, you know, I didn't kind of get cut really bad or sliced open or anything. So um, I, I, um, 
so anyway, I grabbed my, my uh, left wrist and I just kind of threw it over my body um, and just flopped down. Like I couldn't move. It was just really weird. And um, so I sat up and I tried to move my feet, but I had to pull it out of kind of the rubble and, and, and cause it was just cramped and my, my all my f- feet, both my feet ended up being completely bruised, like a black and blue and everything. And I, then I quickly kind of looked around the plane and I thought, Oh, well, where's, where's Angela? Um, is she okay? And then, and I thought, Oh yeah, Cecil as well. Where are they? And, and, and I didn't hear anyone. So I thought, well, maybe everyone's out. I thought we were in a field somewhere and maybe they're waiting on me. Um, and so I, uh, I thought, well, I need to get out of the plane. So I went to get out of the plane. And when I did, I turned to my left, uh, which was the right hand side of the plane, because that whole side had been ripped off. And I went to go out and, and it felt like a hot iron pressed against my uh, left tricep. And it just, it was like, just, it was painful. So I thought, well, let me just stay here because that hurt. And I, I don't know how I'm going to get out of the, out of the plane. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just stay here. I'm sure, you know, help is on its way to help me get out and all that sort of stuff. But then the heat from the fire, cause there's a lot of fire around. It just got, it got really, really intense. And I thought, man, if I don't get out of the plane, I, I you know, I, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll burn or whatever. So I thought, well, I'm just going to make my way out. So I, I made I kind of stumbled my way out and, um, I remember hearing something on my left and I looked down and that was uh, the gentleman named Leroy um, who was in the co-pilot seat. And I, when I looked down at him, it, it was just kind of like, his face was kind of like soot, you know, like, 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 um, like soot had gotten on his face and stuff and some blood and stuff. And he just kind of whispered saying to go get help. And I, I just started turning around before I heard him, say something and I, I looked back down at him and he he was looking at me but he was looking through me he was looking past me um and then I just heard his breath just kind of go just <sighs> go out and 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 he, he died right right in front of me there and it was actually one of the uh, it was one of the most peaceful experiences I've ever experienced before like he wasn't, he was very peaceful. It, it was a very surreal type of moment. Um, but it wasn't one, it wasn't a tragic moment or anything. It was, it was very, I don't know how to explain. It, it was just very calm and peaceful. And I could tell he was at peace as well. So I just thought, well, I can't do anything to help him anymore. So I, I need to, to walk away from the, the heat from the plane. So I walked off and, um, when I did, when I turned around, um, there was a guy that was coming towards the plane. Uh, he was actually, he'd just gotten off duty. He was a paramedic. He'd just gotten off duty and saw the plane coming down. And so he kind of followed it and he was the first one on the scene and he was calling me away. And, um, uh, we'll probably have a picture you can put up, uh, on, on YouTube and stuff, Chris, but you'll see in that, um, he's, he's got one hand kind of waving at me to come towards him and another one pointing towards people because he's telling him to get away. Cause he didn't know if the plane would explode. He didn't know what was going on, but he was telling me to come away from the plane, uh, to get away from it. And, um, uh, and then he said something along the, the lines of let's get you away from the plane so you can lay down. But in my head, all I heard was, you need to lay down. And I just thought, man, that's such a good idea. And I just literally flopped backwards. And there's another picture where you can see he's kind of like leaning down to catch me so I don't bang my head against the ground. And um, so I just laid there. Um, kind of the next person that was on the scene was an off, uh, off-duty nurse. She just finished her shift at the hospital. And so she showed up and she was amazing. She stayed with me the whole time. And, um, uh, the, where I was kind of positioned on the ground, um, the plane was to my right. And, um, uh, I heard a big explosion, uh, which I didn't know what was going on with that. It ended up being one of the tires blew up because of the heat. And, um, so she actually changed sides and got in front of me. Cause I, I kind of started getting like, what's going on and where's my friends and all that sort of stuff. So she just stood in front of me. So I couldn't and nailed down. So I couldn't see 
anything and just kept me calm. And I, I was in and out of consciousness a lot. Um, and so she was there and just helped me. She was, she was amazing. I'm getting choked up thinking about it. She was just there for me the whole time. And, um, um, and then Cecil ended up um, kind of walking out of the plane as well. But then, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, uh, as I said, Leroy died and then, and then the other two passed away as well in, in the crash. Um, so it was, it was, it was pretty, um, it, it was, it was a very, it was a tragic event. Um, it was pretty tough, uh, obviously for those family members where, you know, people had passed away. Um, but it was really tough on me as well, uh, over that next year, um, just dealing with survivor's guilt, which is definitely a massive thing. I'm sure Chris, you've, your background and people you speak with, it's probably a very common thing, <laughs> but, um, and I haven't experienced in any sort of way yeah. as a lot of military folks have, but anyway, yeah. Gosh. Did you say the girl's name? Was it, was it Angela? Sorry. Yeah. Angela. Yeah. And, and, and where was she kind of geographically in all of this? Was she still in the plane or? She was. So what had happened is when the plane torqued, her seat had basically, the bolts had come undone and she, um, her seat was all the way towards the back of the plane next to the door. And then Cecil's seat was a bit in front of her to the left and her seat had basically gone to the left and behind his. So I couldn't see her. She was there, but I couldn't see her. And so that's why when I kind of looked her, and again, it, it's a tiny plane, but when you're in that, your mind is all over the place. And, um, just because I couldn't see her, I, I just thought she'd gotten out. So, yeah. But she was, so you're saying she was basically wedged at the back of the plane. Well, she was, she was, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say wedge, but yeah, her, her seat had fallen yeah, okay. over. And so the, her, the seat was kind of hiding her. I couldn't see. So she was kind of behind Cecil's seat as well. I'm just and, trying to think like, that's probably better for you not not seeing that right you know I, mean, I think so um the last memory of her is uh the one i want to keep you know and that was us looking at each other in the plane and um uh i mean even even um at the uh, i was invited to go along to the uh kind of the they had an open cast casket before the actual funeral and i just um actually I decided not to go to that because I didn't want to see, I, I wanted the, my last memory of her to be of her alive. Um, plus I, I couldn't get out of the hospital that a day early. Anyway, I was in the hospital and, and the people at the hospital were telling me I shouldn't go. Um, Cause we needed to drive an, uh, well, I think it was about a three hour drive back to Houston. Um, but I was like, I'm not missing her funeral. So you, you guys are going to have to strap me in this bed. So they, they, um, they went ahead and discharged me uh, and we drove back and, um, and then, and then we got back just in time for the funeral. Um, so uh, yeah, it was, um, it was, it was a very, very unique experience. Uh, for for everyone and, and unique isn't even the word to use i just don't know what to word to use because it's it's tough so yeah it's a lot to process isn't it it's a lot to process just talking about it yeah the 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 shock of it not just for you but for these people that are responding coming to help you you don't see a plate I, I often look at planes out the window and I just think, like, imagine if that crashed now. I mean, it'd be a traumatic thing just, just to see it in the distance, let alone yeah. to physically be there and then to have to respond to it. Um, I mean, gosh, you know, we, we, we should give a special shout out to all our, you, you call them first responders, right? Or um, yeah we call them our blue light services and God bless them, you know? Yeah. 
they're they're amazing i mean there there was a, a lot of people that showed up and obviously the fire department showed up and um it all you know that like i said that was january 17 2002 and so when the plane came down um the uh, F fbi was called um because they didn't know if it was a plane crash they didn't know if it was some sort of terrorist attack or anything like that um, I found out afterwards that the local hospital changed a lot of its procedures on the way they deal with trauma like that because they realized that they weren't quite equipped to handle that sort of thing. Um, so it was there was a it was a lot. But and, and I'll tell you one other thing that um, a big, big, massive shout out to the Red Cross as well. Um, I, I never knew what they do and how they help people. Um, they were phenomenal. And if you know, if anyone ever uh, questions what the Red Cross does, because I think a lot of people have heard of it, but they don't really know what they do, but they were amazing. Um, they put my mom and my brother up in a hotel. Um, they had, um, the next day, they, uh, they were able to, uh, like my mom, my brother, and a couple other people were actually able to go to the site of the plane crash. And they had people that had gone through tragic experiences or had lost loved ones before. And they had a Red Cross person getting choked up talking about it. Yeah. They, uh, they had a Red Cross person there just standing next to him, just, just, just to be there with them in case they needed to hug someone or cry or just whatever. Um, you know, they brought them teas and coffees and all that sort of stuff. Um, they, they bought clothes for me because obviously my clothes were ruined. Um, you know, it, like the Red Cross was amazing. So, you know, all those people that help with stuff like that, um, you know, they're, they're, they're amazing. They're amazing what they do to help people through stuff like that. So yeah. I've not heard of that service in the UK. Maybe that's a uniquely, I know the Red Cross do a phenomenal job in many different areas. They work a lot in, in asylum and they, you know, get families, families together, but, um, that that sounds possibly uniquely American, unless I'm I'm very much mistaken. Maybe so. I, I until that happened, I would have never known that they they do that. Like it it, it maybe maybe they do it, and it's just something that people just don't know they do. Um, or maybe it is very American. I'm not sure, but uh, they were amazing. They were they were absolutely phenomenal in what they were doing, just to be there and support and help. And um, it was it was just yeah big massive shout out to the red cross <laughs> yes yes definitely and you went to angela's funeral did you go to all of them or, or was there any kind of expectation on did you feel any sort of expectation or um the the only i didn't feel any expectation from anybody um but because of how close i was to angela i i wasn't uh, nothing would have stopped me from going to it unless I just was in a coma, you know, like there was just nothing that was going to stop me. So, um, like I said, I mean, she was like a, a sister to me. So I, I just wasn't going to miss that. Um, everyone was really supportive. I mean, even like her, her family, like I grew up with their family. I was really close with their family and, um, they always, I always felt love from them. Um, even after the funeral, like, um, like I had to be kind of, I, I had a partial torn ACL, uh, you know, I was banged up. I couldn't, it was tough for me to kind of walk and all that kind of stuff. And so I was kind of being help, help kind of walking away from the great, you know, from the, the graveyard and stuff. And, and he, it, even their dad said, look, come, come over, uh, you know, cause they had, you know, the, the afters kind of thing where, you know, they have a little finger food where people can come in and give condolences or whatever is that come, you know, come over. And so they were all, they were always really, I always felt love. Um, although I'm sure um, at times uh, and, and it was never expressed to me, it was never told to me, but, you know, I'm sure at times they probably would have rather, you know, their daughter be here and I would have been the one that passed, which, you know, I totally understand those feelings as well. Um, but I think a lot of what I felt was more just me um, having that survivor's guilt, feeling guilty of living. Why did I live and not the other people? Um, you know, uh, oftentimes people will say things like, 
you know, oh, it just must not have been your time or, oh, you know, God must have really been looking out after you. And, and, I, and I get why people say that. I think they're trying to be um, comforting. Um, but it was always really tough to hear that because I was like, well, I'm not any better than anyone else in the plane. And I wasn't being looked out any more or less than anyone else. And it was those types of things, you know, that was really tough to, you know, I always took it graciously, like, thank you. But in my mind, I was like, I wasn't, I'm not any better. You know, I, I wasn't being looked after any more than anyone else. And so it was, it was a challenge around that for sure. Yeah. And survivor's guilt is, I think it's one of these expressions. It kind of rolls off our tongue because you hear it in, in, in society and we've all watched kind of air crash investigation and, and I mean, these horrendous, I mean, not that yours isn't horrendous, but I mean, all tragedy is horrendous. But when you hear of a plane of 250 people and one person survives, it's like, holy fuck. I know, man. What yeah. that, that. Um, but the reason I say it's just, it's a funny expression is it, 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 it's not just one emotion. It's freaking loads going like this at the same time and it's not just you it's stuff that's coming from the third party so the family's involved yeah um and it's harsh um and yes i have i have been through it you know my my best friend drowned when we were on holiday together and it was a yeah, we've both been taking LSD hmm. and my friend lost the plot. He had a psychotic episode. Wow. I was, you know, this is why I say to people, if you, I make no judgment on how anyone lives their life and mine's just turned out very well. But if you mess with these things, you've, got to be prepared to pay the ultimate price it's it's yeah. just that simple and the longer you mess with them the more likelihood statistically uh, the either you or somebody you love is going to get either badly hurt or, or or dead and yeah uh so yeah you know you 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 partying with your best friend and then he loses the plot and goes and drowns himself in the lake Wow. Uh, and you're absolutely off your head walking down to the lakeside to, to identify your, your best friend's dead body. Wow. And then <laughs> God, I think I'd not suggest any, anyone that um, tries to find this out, but those people that have been absolutely tripping will know it's not the best time uh to be having to deal with the police the ambulance the, the family the, all this but i'm kind of um yeah i'm really strict with myself jay you know it's mm. like there's a way things have got to be done and you do it so i'm there you fucking idiot right what's next okay let's roll a cigarette that's best thing to do at this situation just take five you know and um, what I'm getting to is it's the dealing with the police was, you know, they try and interrogate you a bit because they kind of, this was a big festival, mm -hmm. so they're not stupid. And you just say no comment, right, you know, or just bluff. Um, but then when the family comes into it, it doesn't matter how much they say, oh, we don't blame you. It's like, well, you know, I'm not stupid. You, it's human emotion is, yeah. like, what did my son die and, 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 and you didn't? Or, you know, I yeah. mean, I should have been looking after him. That's, I mean, I believe me, I did my best when, when someone's having a psychotic episode and they are, I could release my responsibility and say it was uncontrollable. I mean, it's really violent at stages, attacking people. And, mm. um, yeah, but it's just, you can't go there. I mean, for, for me, it's done, dusted, move on. That is literally 
a, a line I draw in the sun. Yeah, you're going to get this emotion with a family. That's just the way it is. And I'll be alive. I so said it, 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 it's there, you know, it, it, it's yeah. there. Um, but that's just the way, you know, no one said life's fair and it's not supposed to be easy. And, but very different experience for you, although there's some parallels. You, you saying yours is traumatic and my experience, well, I mean, yeah, it, it's, <laughs> I think any situation like that's traumatic, Jason, isn't it? Um, yeah. And I always tell people, you know, we, we all go through our traumatic experiences and, um, you know, just God, Chris, the, the stuff that you've done and been through and, and all that stuff, I, I can listen to what you, you've been through and go, how did you survive that? You know, um, but people could listen to my, my uh, plane crash experience and go, oh my God, how have you survived that? But then they could talk about something that happened in their life. And I'm thinking, God, how have you survived? So we all have traumatic experiences. And, and it, you know, I always try to look at it from the perspective of, you know, it's not a whose traumatic experience is, is the worst because it all affects us in, in, our, in our own ways. And we all have to work through those stuff. And, you know, not every, most people are, are never going to be in a plane crash. And, and um, you know, I think the majority of, of the population will never have to go through survivor's guilt um, or anything like that, but they all have their own tragedies, you know, whether they were abused or, uh, you know, whether it could be anything. So, you know, I, I always, I always want to make sure that whatever I've gone through and, and will go through, you know, as you said, I'll have more challenges in my life. We all will. Um, I think it's unrealistic to think, to think that we'll just sail through the rest of our lives. But I always want to be able to help people and say, look, no matter what experience you're going through right now or have been going through there uh, as, uh, as this may sound very American positiveness, and I don't mean it to come across that way at all, but there is always something, there is an upside to things as well. You can always take from that and learn from it. And you can, you can apply things to your life and you can always move forward and you can always, um, you can help other people through it. You can develop your life and grow better and stronger through it as well. It doesn't mean ignore the tragedy. It doesn't mean to pretend that the, the challenges aren't there because I don't think that's healthy either, but, you know, being able to just look forward and say, okay, well, what can, how can I use that experience to help other people? How can I use that experience to, um, use that to, to leverage that to reach more people. Um, and that's what I'm um, trying to do more now is take that experience and say, I want to leverage that and have, you know, have that as something where it grabs people's attention so that I can somehow speak impact into their life as well and help them. So, you know, it, it's, that, that's kind of my kind of personal mission in life as well and, and everything I do in my business and all that sort of stuff. So. Well, you're cert certainly uh, achieving that even by being here talking, talking about it now. How did you, um, how did you come to terms of it? Um, you know, we hear expressions like PTSD and all this kind of stuff. It gets really yeah. complicated when you're talking about military personnel, because most of us joined well a significant percentage of us joined up with ptsd from childhood that's kind of a a driver mm. of why people join an elite force and try you know maybe want to prove themselves to somebody or someone or or, or at least not themselves right mm. so it becomes kind of hard picking out uh the the episodes in later life especially after you've been in combat so was it, is it the combat that's driving this? Is, is it deeper? And there's, there's very little work that's been done there um, to kind of enlighten us as to what, what trauma is and, 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 and how it is. And I often say, yeah, trauma in adult life, it's very different to experiencing trauma as a, as a toddler. So from, say, domestic violence in the family or, 
um, mental, mental abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, whatever it is, because when you're that toddler, you, you can't make sense of it. You, mm. you literally don't know what's happened. You kind of sense something's not right, but maybe it's you. So you internalize it. And this is why childhood trauma suffers carry that for life, you know, because it's internalized at such a young age. Mm. And then it manifests in adulthood, in, in, in your addictions, in your um, compulsive behaviors, in, in, in whatever it might be, some sort of um, unhelpful behaviors, let's say. But then it's a very different thing going through trauma as an adult because you have a brain, you have a fairly good control over it. You can have the ability to rationalize, compartmentalize, make sense of an experience, bring in the psychology, the philosophy, the spirituality, ha have the support around you of people you can, you can talk to and get support, support from, right? So I, I find it really fascinating. I think it's so valid that we can have this conversation um, but I'm interested to ask you, Jason, what, you, you know, how did it affect you? How did you cope with it? Who helped you? What mechanisms yeah. did you in, 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 employ? Was it something you got to a point where, right, it's, it's behind me? Because when my friend drowned, I, I kissed him goodbye and then I went on and smashed my life and I, I'm a bit mm. maybe ruthless, people might think, but it's to me, it's, that's done, it's dusted. We both need a score. We've travelled the whole world together. We've had a smashing time. It's just sad for the family mm. in that respect. And am I going to carry any guilt? No, am I? Fuck. It, it, you know, I, I got my family to think about, mm. right? And yeah. I'm quite ruthless and bloody-minded. Like, and that goes back to the military where you've got a guy dead on the street of Belfast, and the corporal tries to resuscitate and just looks up and goes, that's it. And you move on because you've mm. got a job to do. You, you can't, you haven't got time for grieving or yeah. all this kind of stuff. Right. Possibly again, why trauma affects people years after their service. Yeah. So, so how was your experience of it? Um, it? It was. So a few things around it. Um, my, I, I ended up moving in with my mom for a while um, because she helped me just to get back up on my feet with stuff. And um, she, she wanted me to go see a counselor. I didn't want to see one, um, but I ended up just going, okay, I'll go. So I went, um, ended up doing some sessions with a counselor and um, she kind of diagnosed me with a mild form of PTSD. And, um, but that it was really helpful going in that counselor. I'm glad my mom, you know, pushed me to do that. Um, so that was really helpful. Um, I did have good friends around me that were really supportive and helpful. Um, I think one thing you know, that was definitely helpful through that is, uh, you know, the, the, the families that were involved, like I said earlier, none of them ever, I, 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 none of them ever were hateful towards me for surviving when, you know, their family member didn't. Um, and I think that was a great help. Um, but I, I remember, one of the things that uh, I had to work through quite a lot was probably a few weeks afterwards, I, I, I realized that I couldn't see past a few hours in, in my life. So uh, when I talk about, you know, writing out those goals um, on the, for the business I was looking at on the plane, it was literally like almost night and day. Like I was on the plane thinking, months and years ahead it was planning out but after the crash i'd wake up in the morning and it was like if i looked at what i do past 12 o'clock there was just a fog in my head i couldn't see it it was just it was impossible for me to see what i was going to do uh, and and it scared me a bit because i was like this is really weird i was thinking months and years ahead right before the crash and now I, I literally couldn't even think about what I would eat that afternoon. My, my, it's like my brain shut down. And so what I started doing is I would, I would go as far as I could in my mind. And then I would just, I would push 15 minutes past that. 
and just go, okay, what am I going to just do for the next 15 minutes past this fog? And after a couple of days, I'd get to about 1230 in the afternoon in my head. And then I'd wake up and, you know, let's say I wake up at eight, I, I could get to one o'clock and then I'll go, okay, well, what, what am I going to do past that? And, you know, we take it for granted. When we wake up in the morning, we kind of have our whole day planned out. You know, we're going to get up, we're going to get dressed, we're going to go to work. Then we've got all these things we need to do. And then we're going to come home and we're going to do this and we'll have our dinner. And then we're going to do this in the evening. And then we got this on the weekend. It, it's just so fast in our head. We don't even think about it. I, I couldn't, I couldn't do that no matter how hard I tried. And so I would just, I'd push myself. It was like I was exercising my mental capacity. Um, and that went on for weeks and weeks. Um, and, and eventually after about two or three months, I, I would say it probably took a good six to seven months before I got to a place where I felt kind of like I could see normally again in my head. And um, so that was something that I, I worked on. And, and I don't, I don't know if that's common for other people that have been through traumas like that. Um, I'd say it, it, in some ways it's kind of similar, uh, but I just know what I kind of went through, but I, that's one thing um, that I just remember. It was a very proactive decision on what I was going to do to expand out that mental capacity, be able to just see ahead and see the future again. Um and but then kind of the guilt of it, I think, Chris, that has been something that I've kind of dealt with quite a lot for a long time. You know, we're 19 years now past that. And I am, um, you know, looking at um, stuff. It's only been probably I've been more open. I've never mind talking about the plane crash, but in terms of of using that experience as a point of leverage to be able to reach more people to impact them. Uh, I always felt guilty for that. Cause like, how could I use something tragic where people, my friends have lost their life and leverage that somehow to benefit me. Um, and that's kind of the way that I, I would look at it. And, and that was tough, but I've gotten to a point where I was like, you know what? It's my life. It's my story. And if I don't express that, if I don't use that, in a way I'm actually doing a disservice to other people that I can actually help. So I'm not going to hide what I've been through. Um, and not that I was hiding it, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to use it to impact as many people as I can in a positive way. So that, that, that's been a tough thing for me, um, you know, for, for a long time. So. Yeah. There's something to be said, isn't there about the truth in life. I came from a, a generation where my parents, were they they had an inability to tell us the truth there was so many um rules in society and and class system and and etiquette and 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 pride and ego and all this complicated mesh that is called british english society that people just pretended they were something they were not um and it's, I think it's unhelpful. I don't know. I might be, I might, there may, may be aspects of it that, that, that were positive, but mm. um, yeah, I just think, you know, you're telling your truth. It's going to help people. Yeah. Maybe it will help someone realize, my God, thank God I haven't been, I haven't been through, you know, I mean, look at this guy. He's been able to pick himself up from this. I can do the same with the death of my, my partner or the death of a loved one or, or this or a mishap at work or whatever it, it, yeah. it, might, it might be. Um, Jason, I'm acutely aware of, of your time. I know that you've got another appointment. I think it was 10 minutes ago, so you've been very kind. Can you just tell us a bit about what you're doing now? Yeah, sure. Of course, Chris. I mean, I, I wish we could talk for ages, but um, uh, I, so what I do now, I, um, I really tra originally trained up, tra trained up as a life coach about 15 years ago and started marketing myself online and did very well at it um, as, you know, built up an email list of 9,000 people, started coaching people in 13 countries and then started getting asked a lot about how you market yourself and how you build your business. So 
uh, for the last kind of 12 years, I've been very much focused on helping other businesses and companies um, with their online marketing, um, which uh, I love doing. Um, it's helping them. I do a lot of LinkedIn marketing for people and consulting with that. So that's what I do with my business now. And I work with a lot of coaches and consultants as well, which I love because if I can help them reach out more to more people and market themselves, it means they're able to positive, positive, positively inf- uh, impact more people as well. So um, it's so that's what I do, and and I love it. I I kind of a bit of a geek around all the online marketing stuff. I love it, but um, yeah, that's what I do. Just help uh, help corporations as well as companies, um, uh, co- coaches, consultants, and, and advisors with their their LinkedIn marketing strategies and online marketing strategies. Well, let's have you back on the show and let's just talk about that because I think that will. I mean, this is the world we live in now. Technology. It's I I I don't like it. I think it's made stuff. You know, I can't just log into my email now. Now I have to get my phone and do this code. And and it's just, it takes so much of my day when I could be doing something that I love or spending time with someone I love. One last question then. What's, I I often see people going, oh, I'm a business, so I've got to have a Twitter account. I'm like, no, it doesn't work like that. It's only good having a Twitter account. People follow you. Then you've got to use hashtags. Otherwise it's like you're you're, you're talking to yourself. (laughs) Yeah. Um, so just quick, rough answer. What what's the biggest mistake companies make then when it comes to marketing themselves through through social media or, or, or whatever? Well, uh, the biggest mistake I see people make is they they often lump themselves into an overall uh, group uh, or category and they fall into what I call a commodity commodity based marketing. So they'll just say, yeah, we're a construction company, or yeah, I'm a life coach, or I'm an accountant, which doesn't mean anything. People just make snap judgments about what you're able to do and all that sort of thing. So um, like one of my uh, clients is an IFA, so an independent financial advisor, and that's the way he labeled himself. And he's very good at what he does. And we just helped reposition what he does, find out what he's really good at. And um, he loves helping people with their pensions. And he said, you know, he says, I love pensions. I can help people, high net earners, retire up to 10 years early by re- by restructuring their pensions. And I was like, well, that's very different from just calling yourself an IFA. And so, you know, we helped reposition what he did. And within six weeks, he, he generated an additional 30,000 pounds of business just by repositioning what he does so that he's not in this commodity based market where people make snap judgments on what you do, the services you provide. And oftentimes where you compete on price, um, which is not a good place to be. Cause if you if you compete on price, your, your prices will always be driven down. So you want to be able to stand out, be different, know how to position yourself on social media and then how to reach out to your, your ideal target market. But um, yeah, we, I mean, I could talk about this for ages. So more than happy, Chris, if you want me back on, we can go into more Absolutely. depth around that. So yeah. just a, one very quick anecdote there. I've got a fellow brother, Royal Marine that um, does life coaching and he yeah. just changed his tagline to the man coach. Yep. And immediately that just resonated with all those men out there that just yeah. want to be like more men <laughs> or, or, yeah, yeah. or get a bit more from, from, from their life. Jason, I, I absolutely love this chat. Um, I yeah. appreciate you, you know, telling such a, uh, a traumatic story with, with such what, uh, candor, um, and for everything you've been through, uh, to all our friends at home, Remember, the past is called the past because it's in the past. Ultimate self-love for yourself. You're loved under this universe. Yeah. I love you and so do the people watching this show now. Leave it behind. It's history. Yeah. Yeah. Get on and smash your life just like Jason's doing, just like I do, because you get one life and it's worth living in paradise. Please like and subscribe. Much love, everyone. Thank you, Jason. Hey, my pleasure, Chris. Thanks a million.